It's another edition of the Wrap-Up Show with John Schaefer and Jim Russell, as always, presented by Mark Nimitz at Farmers Insurance. We're about to catch up with the longtime voice of the A's, Ken Korak. We'll talk about Bob Melvin, what it could mean for San Diego. Also about some of the potential moves the A's might have on field, how that could impact the Padres potentially. So stick around for that conversation. As always, though, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, If you hit that subscribe button, you're going to get year-round exclusive Padres content. Look at Jim. I mean, Jim is pointing down there. Hit the subscribe button if you want more Padres content. Hot stove, uh, free agency conversation, spring training, everything. 2022 season, we have you covered. Subscribe, hit the notification bell. Also, like these videos and follow us on Twitter. At John Schaefer, at Jim Russell SD. I want to tell you also about our title sponsor before we catch up with Ken Korak. If you're shopping for auto home runners or life insurance in San Diego, you got to look towards Mark Nimitz who's a huge baseball fan. He's a San Diegan. He's at Farmers. He's got a decade of experience helping people like us find the perfect insurance products. He's a supporter of the wrap-up show. If you are as well and you have any insurance needs, all we ask that you do is click the link down below. You'll get to Mark's website. He can help you and your family with your insurance needs. If you want to reach out to him, if you're wondering how can I get a hold of him, very simple. All his information is above my head. His phone number and his Email address mnimitz at farmersagent.com. Tell them that the wrap-up show John and Jim sent you. All right, Ken Korak has known Bob Melvin for the better part of the last decade plus. He has interviewed him thousands of times before games on his manager's report. And here's our conversation with Ken. So, Ken, you know, you've known, obviously, Bob Melvin for a number of years. In your opinion, what type of manager are the Padres getting? Well, John and Jim, first of all, thanks for having me on your show. And, and yeah, I spent over 10 years with uh with bob or or bo mel as we call a lot of people call him and uh i can't say enough good things about him uh to me in in every respect he is the embodiment of what you'd want as a major league manager so um i don't think there's any doubt that the padres got one of the best and one of the best managers in the business were you surprised by the move Uh, i I feel like it happened kind of in secret um uh, bob melvin just you know, re-upped his contract or extension earlier this year for the 2022 year. Were you surprised by the move from Bob Melvin, or did you kind of see this coming with the I, direction of the A's? I guess yes and no. You're right, though. They picked up his option for the for 2022, so he was under contract. But I, you know, I knew that there were going to be vacancies this year, and I knew that that he, he'd be in demand. And so from that standpoint. I am and I'm not. And I think it was going to take a, I think a great situation for him to leave the A's. And I, and I think that the fact the Padres have such a, you know, really talented ball club, I think that, I don't think he would have gone just anywhere. So I think going to San Diego uh, was a big reason why. And, 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 you know, the A's had to grant him permission, which they did. Ken, if you pinpoint the strengths of Bob Melvin as a manager, what do you see as some of the things that has allowed him to be successful, not just for a year or two, but essentially for the better part of the last 20 years as a manager? Well, boy, I don't know where I can where I'd start with that. I think, first of all, he engenders a tremendous amount of respect in the clubhouse. So I haven't talked or heard any comment by any player other than just laudatory comments about him but he just he, he really they, they like him he's a great communicator which is a cliche I think but they respect him a lot and then he, he doesn't miss anything he is he's really cerebral he's a he, you know he's a gentleman um and he he does a great job he really and he you know he gets it with the media as far as is dealing with with all of us and what we do um and I think that may mask the fact that he's incredibly competitive uh, he really burns to win. And as far as the strategy of the game, and you talk to people like Tony La Russa, um, and I don't think anybody's really kind of analyzed baseball strategy any more than Tony has done. And he talks about the great challenge uh, in managing against uh, Melvin. So for, I mean, in every way, um, you know, he's just, he answers, um, and all the check marks are there with him. You mentioned Tony La Russa and you mentioned his style of managing and and Bob actually mentioned it during his press conference that, you know, balancing the analytics with uh, his his style of, of managing. How well does he truly balance those two when you watch him manage games and, and as far as bullpen and, and pinch hitting stuff like how well does he balance those analytics? Because that's the new age of baseball. 
Well, you have to do that, right? I'm sure you mm -hmm. guys agree that there's going to be an influence from the front office. But I think, you know, you've got to use your eyes, too, and your gut. And so I think that, that balancing it is, is a really good way to put it. And he's really good at that. I think he has a great feel for analytics. And he'll work with the front office, and he'll certainly take their input. But uh, then when the game starts, and, and even before the game, he's going to do what he thinks is, is best to win a game. So I think he can bridge the two which I think is really important and it also really helps you in the clubhouse so the players don't think that you're just a, a push button manager though so that you know when something happens automatically you're going to do this because the analytics uh, say that you have to do that. Ken, how would you say that he is in general with young players that are still in the beginning of their careers? Maybe not first-year players. I mean, Fernando Tatis Jr. has been in the big leagues three years, but he's only 22 years of age. So you know, what type of manager is he with some of the younger players? I was surprised when he said during his press conference, he believes the youth of a team often becomes the leadership of the team in today's game as opposed to the veterans of a team. So how do you think he'll do with some of these young stars like Fernando Tatis? Well, he's not afraid to have to let his young players have their say. And if you look at all the postseasons and the A's, you know, from beginning in 2012, went to the postseason a bunch with with Bob uh, and he he'll rely on, on young guys and he'll give them that kind of responsibility. And I think you look at our, our club the last two or three, four years that Matt Chapman became like basically kind of the, one of the leaders, if not the leader on the team by the time he was in his second or third year. So he will give those guys responsibility. Uh, he'll also communicate with his bench players. He'll tell a guy ahead of time, maybe a day before or two days before, that he's going to play. So those guys know exactly how to prepare. So, and, and I think that there was kind of a tough love aspect to Bob coming up and he, you know, he played for Sparky Anderson with the Tigers and mm -hmm. Sparky is one of those guys. And obviously one of the great managers of all time, but kind of old school where he didn't talk to the kids hardly at all. And I think Bob kind of learned from that and said, you know, I think I'm going to communicate a little bit more than Sparky mm -hmm. did with me. Uh, Ken, in your opinion, what kind of difference can the right manager make? Well, I think you can make a big difference. And, and I don't pretend to know that much about your ball club. Uh, we see them in the spring and then occasionally in interleague play. But I think on the surface, it looks to me like because they had such a tough second half and faded down the stretch, that I think he will come in and immediately kind of command respect almost because of that. And I think that the Padre players are going to buy into what he wants to accomplish from the first day of spring training. So I think that he will make a big impact with, with, um, with the Friars. And given good health, I'd be surprised if they didn't have a great year. Ken, does he have any like Melvinisms, whether that's <laughs> what he says to the media or how he is within the clubhouse? Is there something kind of unique to the style in which he communicates? You know, we did two or 3,000 manager shows over the year. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much every day. He is slightly superstitious. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, he's, he says, I'm not superstitious, but just in case. So, yeah, he's, in, you know, you can read a little bit about that. So so I think that would be, if that's a Melvinism or, or whatever it, it is, um, he has a little bit of a superstitious side for sure. What are some of those superstitions that, <laughs> you know of well you don't have you don't have enough time <laughs> no i mean it's like little stuff we have a lot of fun on the manager show mm. like and and you know like you don't have to you don't have to count down like we used to do in the days of cassettes right three two one and you go you don't have to do that but we would do that and let's say i said three two one and the a's lost the game that day We'd have to find new numbers the next day. Or maybe if I was sitting to his left in the dugout doing the show and they won three or four in a row, you know that I'd be sitting to his left doing the show the next day. So and that was kind of it was kind of fun. But those are kind of the kind of the little kind of things that that can keep it light during a season. I like it. Yeah. Can, can I yeah. want to ask you just about your expectations for the offseason? Because it's been so unique. I mean, we know this the pandemic season was the shortened year. Now we're heading into another CBA where there could be a looming lockout in December. We don't know about free agency. 
what do you what do you expect here in the coming weeks and months and um you know what impact is it going to have on on major league baseball and its fans potentially for 2022 i think guys that's a great question i i do believe and i've been you know pretty much in vacation mode ever since the season ended, so i really haven't talked to too many people with our club during that time i think there's a real concern about a work stoppage when the cba runs out on the first of december so it wouldn't surprise me if there was a lockout and then if that happens then all the transactions any everything is frozen right you can't really do anything so whether there may be a flurry of activity now in the next two or three weeks before that i don't know so i think from from the labor standpoint with baseball right now uh i think we might be going into kind of a great unknown and you know, let's hope they can work it out because nobody wants to relive some of the nightmares that we've, you know, we've all lived through in the past. Yeah, we do not want a work stoppage. Uh, one player on the A's, Matt Olson, um, rumored could be on the move. What do you expect uh, the Matt Olson um, as a player, like if he is moved, like what type of asset is he and what type of player is Matt Olson? Because he had a massive year last year. Well, first of is he isn't moved and right. one thing the a's have done and you know they've traded their guys and i think billy bean has always subscribed to the theory that you're better off trading or letting someone go a year or two early than a year or two late but you know he's not going into his free agent year mm-hmm. so my hope is that they'll they'll keep him and chapman and the rest of the guys and you know chapman won a gold glove and sean murphy behind the plate they still have a core of a pretty good club that I think can make the postseason next year. So we'll see. The A's have never thrown in the towel. And this is mm-hmm. I've done 26 years of A's baseball. So they've contended most years. But to answer your question about Olsen, he's just a great player. Uh, he easily could have won the gold glove. And I'm not saying that Guriel wasn't deserving, and he was. But Olsen made a real transformation from a, a subpar year, admittedly in the shortened season of 2020 to last year. He can hit for power. He has great discipline. He walks a lot, high on base. He is an outstanding defender. I think consistently he'll be an MVP candidate. I think he'll be in the top 10 this year. Uh, and he's just one of the great guys. He plays every day. Uh, he's one of, I think Melvin will say, that would say this one of Bo Mel's all-time favorite players. They've had a great relationship going back to when Matt was in the minor leagues. So he's, he's just one of the best players in the game. Ken, I'll preface it by saying I absolutely hate relocation. It's impacted San Diego. It's impacted the Bay Area and Oakland, obviously, previously. With that being said, you know, what is the state of the franchise and what is the short-term and long-term plan for Oakland's organization moving forward? I wish I had the answer to that, John and Jim. I just mm-hmm. don't know. I, I, I think it's up in the air right now. Uh, they're hopeful to get a waterfront ballpark and, and get that approved. It's a, it's a massive project about – $12 billion up on the waterfront in Oakland, just north of Jack London Square. Um, Dave Cavill, the A's president, would be the first to tell you it's they're, they're on two tracks right now and looking at stadium possibilities. One is in Oakland and one is uh, somewhere out in Las Vegas. So, um, and, you know, my hope is that there'll be some resolution by the end of the year because this kind of uncertainty isn't healthy for anyone and especially the fan base. And you know, I'm hoping they can get something done in Oakland because the A's have a, a tremendously rich history um, in Oakland, as you guys know, with all the postseasons and the world championships and, and the great clubs they've had over the years. So now the biggest move in the offseason for the A's is finding a new manager. And, and Billy Bean is still there. Um, where do you think they could go for their next manager from within? Or do you think Billy could bring someone from outside the organization? Well, I don't know, and Billy's there, and David Forrest, the SGM, is still there, and mm-hmm. I've, I've, and I've really hesitated over the years to predict what Billy and David will do, and normally I'm pleasantly surprised. So, you know, there are internal candidates like Mark Kotze, I think, is, you know, a guy who has a real background down in San Diego, and Ryan Christensen. Uh, if you're looking outside the organization, I think one of the the fan favorites would be Ron Washington for very good reason. Um, he did a great job when he was coaching third base for the A's uh, for several years. And then, you know, obviously during his time managing the Rangers. So, you know, off the top of my head, those would be three guys. And, and he could certainly surprise us with uh, another two or three candidates as well. 
Ken, before we let you go, how do you unwind after the length that a baseball season is? Do you ever really get used to what it entails, which is basically 200 games with spring training in 200 days? And how is your offseason different than what you do for a living the other six, seven, eight months? Well, and as, as you guys, it's, you know, I've been very privileged to be able to do this for all these years. So there are no complaints, but the, the season is like total immersion. Um, I did 154 games this past mm -hmm. year, although we didn't travel. But it's a pretty easy transition now for me since I'm not doing any of the other sports in the off season. So I just played nine holes. So that might be a, give you a good <laughs> example, a good idea of what what's in store for me during the off season. Catch up with my family and, you know, things like that. So lots of golf. Uh, love it. Yeah, the transition not a difficult one for me at this point. What'd you shoot on those 36 holes? 35, 34? <laughs> on those nine? <laughs> yeah. I almost broke 40. It's pretty close. Like 40 <laughs> today. So pretty good. Yeah. Hey, Ken, Ken, we greatly appreciate your time. We wish you the absolute best of luck. We're looking forward to getting to meet Bob Melvin here in San Diego. And we appreciate you doing well, it today. We'll really enjoy your time with him for sure. The Padres got a great guy. Thanks for having me on your show. All right, really fun conversation with Ken. Glad we could do that today, Jim. And it's really interesting to learn more about Bob Melvin kind of behind the scenes. You can see the managerial record, but Ken really spoke highly of Bob. Yeah, it just seems like the more people you talk to, they all give you the same message about Bob Melvin, that he's a great communicator, great manager, and oh, by the way, you're going to love him. So I'm excited to cover Bob Melvin for hopefully longer than three years, but it's, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Much more from the GM meetings in Carlsbad this week. If you're looking for more Padres content, we are here for you. Just hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell. Remember to like these videos and follow us on Twitter as well. At John Schaefer, at Jim Russell SD. And until next time, this has been the Wrap-Up Show. Presented by Mark Nimitz at Farmers Insurance.